Okay, so now we are going to talk a bit about water. And the reason we're going to talk about water is because water is essential for life. And again, we're talking about biology and we're talking about the study of life. And so when we talk about water, um, this is going to be uh, in consideration throughout the rest of the semester. So uh, water is essential for life. Our cells are made up of about 60 to 70 percent uh, water. And life cannot exist without water. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of these characteristics of water that make it so important to life. So first we'll do just kind of a refresher on the structure of water. So remember water, of course, is H2O. <clears throat> that means that there is an oxygen molecule or an oxygen atom. And then we have that connected to two hydrogens. And if you'll notice, the reason uh, that it's drawn the way that it is is because H2O, or water, actually forms this bent structure. Um, it's not actually straight like this. Um, when it is uh, forming, uh, for reasons that we're not going to completely go into here, we actually have um, some extra electrons over here, and they, they tend to hang out next to each other in this area here, which means that the hydrogens kind of are sequestered over in this area. Uh, so we end up with this bent structure. And then, as we've already talked about, our water is polar. Remember, these are polar covalent bonds. And what makes them polar is that we have this partial negative over here by the oxygen, and then we have partial positives on the hydrogens. And remember what that meant was that these electrons here are going to spend more time around the oxygen than they spend around these hydrogens. And so then, since our electrons are negatively charged, we end up having more negative charge over by the oxygen and less negative charge or more positive charge near the hydrogens. And then, since we have this partial negative, partial positive, what this allows us to then have are hydrogen bonds. Remember, hydrogen bonds are weak bonds and they are formed and then easily broken. And so then we have our partial positive hydrogens, our partial negative oxygen, and we can form up to four hydrogen bonds. Let me write that up here. Four hydrogen bonds uh, per water molecule. And so we can draw some other water molecules here. So the partial positive of the hydrogen is going to form a hydrogen bond with this partial negative of the oxygen. We see the same thing over here this partial positive with the partial negative, and then we have our partial negative oxygens on another water molecule with the partial positive hydrogen here, and then we see the same thing with this uh, partial positive oops, hydrogen here. So the partial negative oxygen is attracted to the partial positive hydrogen. <clears throat> and so then we can see this is one, two, three, four hydrogen bonds that we end up forming with this single molecule, this one right here is the one that we started with, single molecule of, ox uh, of water. <clears throat> so then we're going to take a look at some of the, the properties of water. And so the properties that we're going to talk about are due to these hydrogen bonds. Uh, the first property that we're going to talk about is ice, um, that ice floats. And ice floats because it is less dense than water. So let's take a look at why water is more dense than ice, or why ice is less dense than water. So first let's see liquid water. If we're talking about uh, liquid water, then our hydrogen bonds are very, very temporary. Uh, so we've already mentioned that, that these water molecules are moving around very, very quickly, and then they're forming hydrogen bonds and then breaking them and forming them and breaking them and forming them and breaking them. And in liquid water, we generally have just about three hydrogen bonds at a time because we don't end up getting all four hydrogen bonds before those are broken and then new ones are formed. And so then what we end up seeing is that there are varying distances uh, between these different molecules. So we can have uh, these different bonds that are formed here. We'll just draw a couple of these in. And then... Well, we won't draw the fourth one in because we're going to say there's mostly three. So one, two, and then three hydrogen bonds there. But you can see here in liquid water, uh, they're relatively close to each other. And then, again, these are going to be breaking, and then we're going to be forming new ones. 
and then this one will break, and then we'll form a new one. Uh, so it's these water molecules are very, very close to each other, and they're moving around a lot. Now in ice, because it's so cold, what we end up seeing is that we form a crystalline structure. And so it's going to form all four hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds are going to end up being further apart uh, because they are more stable. They're not moving around because of the, the temperature of water. They're much, much slower. They're moving very, very slow. And then once they get to the freezing point um, to where it actually is ice, then they're not moving anymore. And so these bonds are holding these molecules further apart. And if they're holding them further apart, then that's going to be making a less dense product. So if we look at the difference here that I've drawn between over here, this would be ice, and then over here, this would be our liquid water, you can see that we have the four bonds here, and I've tried to make them all the same distance, uh, because then what we would see here is that then we're going to see the same distance with the next water molecule, and then the same distance with the next water molecule, and on and on and on. And what we end up seeing is there's much more distance between these water molecules as they're being formed or as they are solidified in ice than what we see in liquid, where we have lots of movement and they're very, very close to each other. And so this makes it less dense since they're being held further apart. And this is important because then it keeps bodies of water from freezing solid. And this is important so that we, we end up making this layer of ice on, tops of, on top of lakes, on top of ponds and things. And then we still have life living below it in the liquid water. And then essentially it acts as sort of insulator because it's floating on top. Uh, it's less dense. And then we kind of have this insulator to the cold temperature, to the exterior and the air. And then we have the ability to have life underneath that surface. So the first property, this is our first property, is that ice is less dense than water. So we're talking about water and ice in this property. Uh, the second property that we're going to talk about is cohesion and adhesion. So cohesion and adhesion. So cohesion... Uh, to start with, cohesion is where water molecules are attracted to each other by lots of hydrogen bonds. So we already know that, but this is the term for it. Uh, water molecules are attracted to each other by lots of hydrogen bonds. Bond. So this is cohesion, and, and what we're talking about here are things like why we can make a drop of water look like a drop of water, and that's because we have all of these little hydrogen bonds in here, and they're all attracted to each other, and because they are attracted to each other, that's what's going to give shape to drops of water. So if you're in your car and you have it's raining, you can see the drops of water actually form on the window or in your house, and then you can see them slide down the window uh, in drop form uh, rather than the molecules being completely separate. This is also what causes surface tension. Uh, so we can say creates water drops. And then those water drops are basically because of this surface tension. Uh, the surface tension is what we see in ponds. Let's say if you think of those insects, the water striders. <coughs> Um, also, the basilic, basilic lizard, basilisk lizard, um, can kind of run across the water, partially because of this surface tension that's created, and that's again because of these hydrogen bonds. And this is what's called cohesion. So we have these hydrogen bonds in water that are all kind of connecting and, and breaking and reconnecting, and then it gives this tension on the water because these bonds are here. <clears throat> this is also important because it holds molecules. So it holds, um, holds molecules, cells, and other things in suspension.
So if we're talking about things like water drops, this is important to keep water in nature so that things can come along and can drink the water off of the water drops, think, think small things like insects or something. Um, the surface tension property of cohesion or part of cohesion is important for things like water striders that need to move across the water in order to get their food. Uh, other things that need to run across the water like the lizard that we mentioned. Um, and then this property, holding molecules, cells, and other things in suspension is important um, for all things, but also if you think about in, from the human perspective, it's important that as the blood is flowing through our body, that our red blood cells, for example, aren't just dropping to the bottom of our blood. They're not just falling out of suspension, that they have some sort of tension that's holding them in place, and that's what this cohesion does inside of the body, for example. Uh, this is also important for things like other molecules, like glucose. Uh, glucose is our basic sugar molecule, and this is important. We need glucose in all of our cells in order to provide us with energy. And so having these molecules floating around in the bloodstream is important um, that they're not settling out of the water. <clears throat> so that is cohesion. Now, the other one here, adhesion, is based on the same thing, except this is where water molecules... are attracted to other substances. So in this case, it's not water molecules being attracted to other water molecules giving us this surface tension. What it is is water molecules attracted to other substances. Um, and so this is allowing, is what allows water to get things wet. Um, so if you think about your shirt, for example, if you're wearing a cotton shirt, for example, and then it's raining and the water falls on there, you can watch water droplets actually kind of dissolve. It's not dissolving, but, but land on you and then soak into a, a shirt, for example. And that's because of adhesion. That's because these water molecules are attracted to other substances. And this is also due to this hydrogen bonding, because remember, our our water molecule is a polar molecule. And so it has these partial positives, partial negatives, and those are going to be attracted to other things. This is also important uh, because this is what at least partially allows water to travel up narrow spaces. So it allows water uh, to travel up narrow spaces. And so this is what is called capillary action. And this is important for things like trees, for example, uh, or other plants. We can put water near their roots, uh, the plant or of the tree, and then that water is going to get to the entire rest of the plant, to the entire rest of the tree through capillary action. And that's because we have these uh, little tiny kind of tubes that are in a tree, for example, and the water is actually going to be attracted to the inside of these tubes. So if you think of a straw, for example, um, water will be attracted to the inside edge of the straw. And then we have cohesion, meaning that the water is attracted to itself and forming some surface tension within the straw and attracted to the insides of the straw itself. Um, in trees, for example, this would be um, certain structures within the tree. And then what happens is as the water is um, filling up these spaces, it gets to the leaves of the tree, and then we have evaporation at the leaves of the tree. And so what happens is if we have all of these uh, water molecules attracted to each other and attracted to the edges of the tube, <clears throat> what we see is if we are up here at the top and our uppermost water molecule, this one here, leaves through evaporation, we have all of these other bonds, all of these water bonds attracted to the other molecules. And as this one goes up, through evaporation up into the sky, up into the, the air there, then it actually drags all of these up with it. And so then it's going to be pulling more water uh, from the roots, which would be down here. <laughs> and so it's drawing the water up through the plant or through the tree, and this is due to the cohesion between these different water molecules and the adhesion, which is between the water molecules and other substances or other surfaces, which would be like the inside of the structure of the plant or the inside of the structure of the tree. All right, so secondly, that was cohesion and adhesion. The third property of water that we are going to look at 
uh, that's important for life is that water resists temperature changes. <clears throat> And this is because water has a high specific heat. And what this means is that it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. Uh, so it takes a lot of energy to change change the temperature of water. So we could look at the different specific heats of some different things. Um, so water actually is given a specific heat of 1.0, uh, which is a high specific heat. And it's based on water. So one is a high specific heat. But if we look at some other things like iron, for example, um, iron has a specific heat of 0 0.11. Or if we look at something like silver or gold, let's say gold has a specific heat of 0 0.03. It's very, very low. Um, and what that means is that it, it maintains a stable temperature. Uh, so it maintains its temperature despite lots of heat being added to the water. <clears throat> and so we can have water, for example, sitting in a pot on the stove. And it might take a while for that to boil. A while, of course, is a relative term, but... Um, sitting there, it takes a lot of energy going into that water before it boils, uh, before it's going to change the temperature of the water. So it maintains a stable temperature, despite heat of reactions and the environment. And so since this has a high specific heat, it also has a high heat of vaporization. And what that means then is, that similarly, it takes a lot of energy uh, to change it from a liquid to a gas. So it takes a lot of energy change from a liquid to a gas. So vaporizing something is, is taking it from a liquid to a gas. And this is important if we think about humans, for example. Uh, so we can use water to cool our body. And water cools the body by using up heat energy as it evaporates. So what this means is that our body will sweat, right? We have sweat glands that release uh, what's mostly water onto the surface of our skin. And then what, what our bodies are able to do then is if we have a high amount of heat in our body, so we are going through lots of chemical reactions in our body, and let's say the environment is very, very hot, you know, we're running, and so we're making a lot of energy in our body because our muscles are utilizing energy and releasing a lot of heat. And then let's say the environment is very hot. It's a hot summer day. And then our body will then start to sweat. And what we do is we put a layer of mostly water on the surface of our skin. And this allows the heat from our body to then be transferred into that water that's on the surface of the skin by the form of sweat. And then it takes quite a bit of heat from the body to be transferred into that water, into let's say a water droplet. And then that water droplet, once it gets so much heat in it, will then evaporate. And when it evaporates, it takes the heat energy with it. And then, of course, we'll continue sweating, which means we're going to be adding more liquid to the surface of the skin. And then when we do that, then the process continues over and over again, where we're going to be placing the heat or utilizing that water as a place to put the heat. And then as that water gets heated up, then it's going to evaporate. And it takes a whole lot of energy to change it from that liquid to a gas, which is very helpful when we want to release a lot of energy. <clears throat> All right, so then the fourth property of water that we're going to talk about is that it makes a good solvent. Now, what is a solvent? A solvent is a liquid that things dissolve in. And lots of things dissolve in water. 
Uh, it's an excellent solvent. <clears throat> and so this is another reason why it's the basis for life. Uh, is because it makes a good solvent, meaning that it allows things to s dissolve in it. So things like glucose that we need, things like sodium chloride or NaCl, like table salt, for example. Um, all of these other electrons that are we commonly call uh, electrolytes, so potassium and, and calcium and, and chlorine and, and all of these different things that our body needs in order to function. And so water is a solvent. It's a very, very good solvent, which is the liquid that things dissolve in. And another term that you should be aware of is what a solute is. And a solute is the molecule that dissolves in a solvent. So when we're talking about water as being a good solvent, then we can talk about the things that will dissolve in that water solvent, and those are called solutes. So if we took a sugar cube, for example, and we add it to a glass of water, or tea, let's say a glass of tea, then in this case, the solvent is going to be water, right, in the tea, and the solute is going to be sugar. If it's a sugar cube, then we're talking about sucrose, which is our technical term for our table sugar. <clears throat> and water makes a very good solvent because of its properties. Do we remember what kind of bond our water bond is? Or, or not hydrogen bond, but the bond within our, our H2O, our water molecule. All right, it is a polar covalent bond. And since it is a polar covalent bond, then water is going to surround each individual molecule and it can separate it from other molecules. <clears throat> and we have different ways that different molecules are going to interact with water. And we're going to take a, a look at that now. So we'll leave up here. H2O is a polar covalent bond. <clears throat> and we remember that because we have our water molecule here, which is partially negative partially positive on those hydrogens. And so, again, this is polar because we have more electrons over here, and that makes it more negative. And then over here we have our hydrogens, which are more positive. So let's take a look at water as a solvent when we're talking about things that have ionic bonds. So if we remember our ionic bonds or ionic molecules, an example that we used... Uh, was NaCl, which is table salt. <clears throat> now our ionic molecules are going to both dissolve and dissociate in water. And so NaCl is a good example of that, which is our table salt. And when we're talking about um, an ionic uh, molecule, or we're talking about like a cation or an anion, what we're talking about a lot of times are electrolytes. So electrolytes are just kind of the fancy term for ions that are useful in the human body. So let's take a look at our example of sodium chloride here. So sodium chloride is our ionic molecule. Uh, it's an electrolyte, and so this is our table salt. So if you can imagine taking table salt, sticking it in a glass of water, stirring it, it's going to dissolve it. And again, in this case, our sodium chloride is going to be our solute, and then our H2O is going to be our solvent. Now, if we take a look at these things, let's say sodium is the little blue ball, and... Chloride, or chlorine, is the big green one. So this would be our sodium chloride, right? So our NaCl. And I'm just going to use the colors um, for ease. Remember when we, when we separated the sodium and the chloride, remember we had sodium was a positive ion or a cation, and chloride was a negative ion. And what we saw was that they formed crystalline structures because we had this positive positive blue ball here because it's going to be the sodium and then the negative green one and these charges are going to be attracted to each other. So what we saw was we have negative chloride ions surrounding the positive sodium ion. But then we had the positive sodium ions surrounding the negative chlorine ions. 
and then we saw this over and over and over again. I'll add some more here. And of course, I can't really draw this, but it's three dimensional as well. So I'm drawing this in two dimensions, but really, this is three dimensional. So what that means is that it's going back this way and back this way. You can think of all the different directions it's going. And then we end up forming uh, kind of a crystal. And it's all made up of these little blue and green that are indicating our sodium and chloride ions. Of course, we need a blue one in there. But uh, So then we take this. Let's say this is our chunk of salt, and we're going to put it in our glass of water. Now, if we take our chunk of salt and we place it in our glass of water, we remember what our water molecule looks like. <clears throat> Let's say this, uh, we'll just draw the, the black ball here, is going to be our oxygen, and the red ones will be the hydrogens. So, of course, we have our partial negative here, partial positive, partial positive. <clears throat> so then, if we drop, let's, our chunk of salt here, which is what this is, right, our salt, and put it into water, what we see is that it's going to dissociate meaning that the sodium and the chloride ions are going to separate. And remember, our sodium is positive, and if that's positive, what we're going to see is we're going to see these negative from our oxygen on our H2O surround that positive charge. So this is negative, right, partial negative. <clears throat> these are our positive hydrogens. And so our negative, our partial negative of our oxygen is going to surround that positive sodium ion. And then we have our negative chloride ion, which then is going to be surrounded by our positive hydrogen ions. And so then what we see is this dissociation where we have the water is going to surround the sodium and it's going to surround the chloride ion. And that's because our water has both negative parts and positive parts. So when we put our sodium chloride, our ions in there, it's going to separate these because water is going to get in there and pull them apart. So it's going to get in there because the oxygen is negative, it's going to pull on that positive sodium. And because the chloride is negative, it's going to be pulled on by those partially positive hydrogens. And then they're going to be separated into solution. And then we see this throughout. So I could, I could draw the same thing again here with another sodium. I'm not going to take the time to do all of that, but surrounded by the negative oxygens. And then we have our positive hydrogens as well, but they're opposite because that's positive. And then we see the same thing with our chloride ion. And so this is why water is a very good solvent. Uh, and this is specifically how it is a good solvent with our ionic molecules. And of course we use sodium chloride as the example here, but we can see other ionic molecules will do the same thing. And we'll see that with potassium, for example, uh, with calcium, for example, um, all of these different ions that are important to the human body, but then also to animals or organisms, living things in general. So that's looking at water as a solvent with ionic molecules. Now let's take a look at water as a solvent with polar covalent molecules. So when we have a polar covalent molecule, these are going to dissolve in water. And when something dissolves in water, when it is a polar covalent molecule, it's what is called hydrophilic. So you need to know that term. Hydro means water. And philic means loving. So these are water-loving molecules. When we're talking about polar covalent molecules, they're polar, and polar is dissolved by polar. Polar likes polar. Nonpolar likes nonpolar. And we're going to take a closer look at that in just a moment. So when we're talking about a polar covalent molecule, we're talking about something that is hydrophilic or water-loving. So in this case, our water molecules are attracted to positive and negative parts of the polar molecules. <clears throat> so if I do kind of a quick um, 
quick drawing of a glucose molecule, which is our most basic sugar molecule. Then what we see is something like this. I have shorthanded this a bit, um, just for illustrative purposes, but we have hydrogens hanging off of here. Um, every corner here is a carbon. So we have lots of carbon-hydrogen bonds. The blue is indicating hydrogens. And then the black is indicating a carbon. And then the red is indicating... Too many here. The red is indicating oxygens. So then what you may notice here is that we have some oxygens hanging off here. And what we then have is a partial negative partial positive situation. Partial positive, partial negative, partial negative. And then these are going to be where we have interactions with water. These are polar portions of our polar covalent molecules. So this is kind of a general drawing of glucose. Oops, I missed an oxygen down here with another hydrogen. <clears throat> so partial negative, partial positive. And so you can see that we're kind of surrounding this entire molecule. And so we see a similar thing happen here that we saw with our ionic molecules. And so what we see is if we have a partial negative up here, then we're going to have our partial positive kind of... Uh, sorry, this is the opposite here. Colors, I didn't think about that. But if this is our oxygen, then our water molecule with its hydrogens... <clears throat> We have our partial positives and our partial negatives, positives. So then we have our positive hydrogen that's going to be attracted to our partial positive or partial negative oxygen here, and the same thing here. So we have our, whoops, that wouldn't be a hydrogen, would it? That would be an oxygen forming a hydrogen bond there. And then we would have our hydrogen bond here. And then hopefully you get the idea by now about how these bonds work. And so in the same way that we had our sodium ion surrounded by the partial negative oxygen and we had our negative chloride ion surrounded by the partial positive hydrogens, we see the same thing happen here. We have our partial negative oxygens and our partial positive hydrogens that are going to be surrounding these partial positive, partial negative, meaning polar molecules. And so again, this would be an example of sugar dissolving in water. So it's not an ion like salt, table salt that dissolves in water, but if we took a spoonful or a sugar cube and we put it in water, we know if we stir it up really well that it will dissolve. And that's because it is hydrophilic, water loving. It can be surrounded by water and then that's dissolving it. Now for our last bond, we have our nonpolar covalent bond. And our nonpolar covalent bond does not dissolve in water. So in this case, instead of it being hydrophilic, it's called hydrophobic. So again, the hydro part relating to water, and then phobic meaning fearing. So this is water fearing or water disliking. So these are things that don't play well with water. These are going to be nonpolar substances, so they don't have the partial positive, partial negatives. So for example, uh, these are things that do not interact with water. So if we think of something um, like a fat, so if you think water and oil don't mix, right? we can think of if you've ever put an oil on top of water, you know it just kind of sits on the top. And that's because oil and other fats like butter or lard are made up of lots and lots and lots of carbon-hydrogen bonds. And if we remember back to our polarity discussion, carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. Um, the carbon nor the hydrogen pulls on the electrons more than the other. Uh, now we do have over here... Um, some This piece here actually does interact with water, but the majority of the molecule, and this is just a shortened version of the molecule. This actually goes on for a really, really long way. Um, the shortened version of the molecule here shows a lot of carbons and hydrogens. Um, so these carbons and hydrogens are not going to interact with water, and so then what we end up seeing is if we have this container, 
Um, what we end up seeing is we have this oil that's just going to be sitting right on top of then the water that's going to be below it. And that's because this is nonpolar. So even if we put something that has a partial negative, partial negative, partial positive, partial positive, there's nothing for it to interact with. There is no partial positive or partial negative in any piece of this, this long chain that we have here. And so then what we see is this separation. And as I mentioned before, nonpolar molecules dissolve in nonpolar molecules. So if we had two different types of oils, for example, we could pour in another type of oil, and then that oil would mix with this other oil. Um, but the green would not go into the water because it would also be nonpolar. It would be hydrophobic. Uh, so hydrophobic things mix with hydrophobic or nonpolar mix with nonpolar, and polar mix with polar. And we know that from oil not mixing with water. All right, so that kind of sums up our water discussion uh, and how water is important to life. The last part of our basic chemistry section that I want to address or that we want to talk about are acids, bases, salts, and then pH. So let's take a look at these things. So when we look at water, if we're looking at pure water, some of the molecules are going to separate into ions. And what I mean by that is, again, we have water, which is H2O, and it's going to separate into a positive hydrogen and a negative hydroxide. Uh, so this is a hydroxide ion, and this is a hydrogen ion. And so really what we're seeing here, and I'm going to use kind of a different style of um, drawing here. These two dots uh, between the oxygen and the hydrogen, of course, are, are bonds. These are electrons. So if we have our H2O here, and our H2O here, so if we have water in a cup with water, right, so we have lots of water in there, what we then see is that this hydrogen is going to be attracted to this partial negative over here. So again, our partial positive hydrogen is going to be attracted to the partial negative of the oxygen on the other water molecule. So then what ends up happening is we end up having three hydrogens on our molecule here. And in this case, it's called a hydronium ion. And so then this is, as I put this large plus sign here, more positive, because now we have more positive than we have negative here, uh, because we have the addition of, of the hydrogen. And then what that leads over here is if this moves over, then we have our hydroxide ion. And in this case, it's very negative, because now we have these extra electrons here. Hydroxide ion. Uh, so we end up having this, and this actually goes both ways. So I'm going to put a double arrow here. So at sometimes when we have a, a glass of water or body of water, we have lots of hydronium ions and hydroxide ions that are separated, and then they go back into H2O, H2O, and then they go from H2O, H2O to H3O, OH, and then back and forth. And so what we see is this kind of um, dissociation uh, in this, this changing of bonds happening, breaking and, and building of bonds. However, what we see here is if we have just pure, plain water, the concentration, the concentration of hydrogen ions equals the concentration of hydroxide ions. All right, so if we're separating this out, we have an equal number. Up here we have one positive here, the hydrogen ion, and we have one negative here with the hydroxide ion. And remember, one positive and one negative are going to be neutral. So in water... Uh, water is neutral. Now this is important uh, because when we talk about acids and bases, what we're going to see is something different. So let's take a look at what an acid is. So that's basic water. Let's take a look at an acid. So acids are ionic molecules that dissociate to release hydrogen ions. So these are going to be releasing hydrogen ions into the water, uh, which means it's increasing the amount of hydrogen ions. 
So for example, if we talk about hydrochloric acid, which is HCl, if we put that in water, we're going to see a dissociation. So we're going to see them into ions, which would be the hydroxide ion, plus our chloride ion, which is negative. And we can see this, and we, we've already seen this, for example, uh, this is not an acid, but remember NaCl. Um, we saw these separate into sodium and chloride. The sodium was positive, our chloride was negative. And then what we ended up seeing was that we had our, our water molecule surrounding it with its partial negative oxygens because it's got this positive in the middle. And then we saw the same thing here, but these were the positive hydrogens. And then surrounding our chloride ion. Now, I don't want to confuse you with using sodium chloride because sodium chloride is not an acid. I just wanted to mention that it dissociates in that same way. So we have our ions in this case, um, which are hydrogen here and chloride here. So our hydrogen chloride. And so we see the same sort of dissociation. Now, when we are talking about water, again, remember, we have our H2O, which is going to hydrogen ions and our hydroxide ions. And again, we had the same number of hydrogen ions as hydroxide, so the same positives as negatives. But then when we add something like hydrochloric acid, now what we're doing is we are increasing the number of hydrogen ions, while the number of hydroxide ions is going to stay the same, because in hydrochloric acid, we're not adding any hydroxide ions. And so an acid is something that increases the number of hydrogen ions. It releases hydrogen ions into the water. Conversely, our, let's say, not, let's not say basic, let's say our bases. So a base, then, are ionic molecules. Ionic molecules that release hydroxide ions into the solution or into water. And so in this case, what we're doing is we're releasing hydroxide ions rather than hydrogen ions. And so then if we use an example, our sodium hydroxide, it's going to separate into sodium, which is positive, and the hydroxide ion, which is negative. And again, if we have our H2O, we have hydrogen and we have our hydroxide ions. We have more hydroxide ions than we have hydrogen ions. So basically what we're saying is that in this case, when we have a base, we are decreasing the amount of hydrogen ions. Now, that's not to say we're actually taking hydrogen ion, ions out or that we're doing something with hydrogen ions. It's just that the concentration of hydroxide ions are higher than the concentration of hydrogen ions. And so a base is something that's going to dissociate and release hydroxide ions. And so then we no longer have this neutral, this balance between the one hydrogen ion and the one hydroxide ion. Now we have more hydroxide ions than we have hydrogen ions. Now our third kind is our salt, our third kind of molecule here. So salts, again, are ionic molecules, but they that do not release or remove hydrogen ions. So the amount of hydrogen ions stays the same. So in this case, it would be something like magnesium chloride, uh, sodium chloride that we've already seen, uh, lithium bromide. So these things, as you can tell by the names, are not going to be releasing hydrogen ions. They're not going to be releasing hydroxide ions. So the number of hydrogen ions and the number of hydroxide ions are going to stay the same. So we still see that dissociation just like we saw with sodium chloride, right? So we have our positive sodium that's going to be surrounded by the negative, and we have our negative chloride that's going to be surrounded by the positive. And so we have that dissociation, but we're not changing the concentration of hydrogen. And so we have these three different types of solutions. And this is going to be important because we're going to be moving into um, pH. And this is important to understand how this is um, going to be 
um, how it's related to pH. So our acids are going to be increasing, right, so increasing hydrogen ions. Our bases are going to be essentially decreasing the concentration of hydrogen ions because it's as it relates to hydroxide ions. And then our salt is going to stay the same. So we don't have an increase or a decrease of hydrogen ions. So let's take a look at pH then, because pH is what is going to kind of draw all of this information together. So our pH scale. Our pH scale indicates the amount of hydrogen ion in solution. So basically it's a measurement of hydrogen ion. So when we talk about pH, um, our neutral pH is 7. So when we have a pH of 7, that is pure water. Because remember, when we talked about pure water, H2O, has an equal number of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. <laughs> so if it's equal, then it's neutral, and at neutral, when we have created our pH scale, we call that 7, pH of 7. Now when we add an acid, if we add something acidic, the acidic side is less than 7, which means it has more hydrogen ions, because remember when we looked at a, an acid and put it in water, it dissociates, and we increase the number of hydrogen ions. So if we have more hydrogen ions, we've added an acid, then we have our pH is less than 7. So we have an increase in hydrogen ions means a decrease in the pH scale. Then we have our basic side of the pH scale, which of course then would be more than 7, which means less hydrogen ions. Remember that was something like NaOH, NaOH, which did not release hydrogen ions or do anything with hydrogen ions, but what it did was it increases hydroxide ions, which means that there's more hydroxide than there is hydrogen. So in this case, what we're talking about is there's less hydrogen ions, per se, which means we have a higher pH. So a decrease in hydrogen ions is an increase in the pH, so a number greater than 7. So if we look at that, really what that looks like is something like this. Our pH scale, I don't know why I drew arrows on there, it's ends. And then we have our middle. So in the center is 7. This is our pH scale. In the center is 7. Up here would be 0, let's say. And then it goes to 14. So our pH scale goes from 0 to 14. 7 in the middle is pure water. Another good example of something in the middle would be blood. Uh, very, very close to 7. We're trying to be close to 7 with that. So then we have everything in between here, right? So we have pH 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So remember our low pH. This is our acidic side. And then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Anything higher than 7 is going to be basic. <clears throat> So what we end up seeing here, something like 2 uh, is like stomach acid, also lemon juice. And then on the other end, like around 12, we have bleach, like household bleach, something that's very basic. Uh, down here, 13 is oven cleaner. Uh, 14, by the way, is sodium hydroxide, very, very basic. And zero up here, since we've been talking about it, is hydrochloric acid. <clears throat> uh, so we have pure water seven. Our example of an acid, which is hydrochloric acid, is zero. And our example of a base, which is sodium hydroxide, is a 14. When we look at this scale, we're using simple numbers like zero to 14. <clears throat> but one step, a one-step change here 
So from seven to six is actually a tenfold change in concentration. So what that means is that a pH of, let's say, four has ten times more hydrogen ions than a solution with a pH five. Or a solution with a pH six has ten times more hydrogen ions than a solution with a pH of seven. And what that means is that a little tiny change in pH is a huge change in the amount of hydrogen ions. Uh, so a little change in pH is a big change in concentration of hydrogen ions because it's tenfold. It's an exponential scale. And so then we see the opposite on, on the other side, right? So 7, or let's say down here, 9, right? Something with a pH of 9 has 10 times more hydrogen ions than something with a pH of 10. Uh, so it's a tenfold scale. The reason why we're talking about pH and the pH scale is because pH is very important to living things. Uh, so it's very, very important because if it is too high or if it's too low, it will prevent cells from functioning. And this is because, uh, mostly because, our cells rely on enzymes. And we're going to talk more about enzymes, but enzymes are uh, these little kind of machines in our cells that are going to do work. They're the things that build up molecules and break down molecules. And so we rely on enzymes to make energy and to provide us with our building blocks of life. So our fats, our carbohydrates, things that build up our body. Uh, so our pH is very important. Our normal pH for a human body, for example, has to be between 7.35 and 7.45, so a very, very narrow range. Um, because if we, do, if we go outside of this range, if we go more acidic or if we go more basic, then these enzymes will be denatured. Denatured means that they break apart and they no longer work. And if we denature our enzymes, if they're no longer working, then our cells will die because they will no longer be able to make energy. And if our cells die because they're not able to make energy, then that means our body dies because it can't make energy. <clears throat> and then no more person because our pH has, been, um, has gone either too acidic or too basic. Now, how do, we, how do we deal with this, right? So if we're drinking a soda, for example, which is very acidic, uh, it's, it's nearly lemon juice status. Uh, if we're drinking lemon juice, if we're drinking lemonade, if we're drinking soda, if we're drinking coffee, all of those things are very acidic. If we put acidic things into our body, then we're going to be increasing our hydrogen ion concentration. <clears throat> if we're increasing the hydrogen ion concentration, right, then we're going to be making our blood acidic, for example. Um, that's what this is. This is our normal blood pH. Sorry, our normal blood pH and other solutions, but mainly what we're going to be looking at for humans, our blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So if we increase our hydrogen ion concentration, we're going to be decreasing the pH in our blood. And now the way that we are going to try to counteract that in the body is by utilizing things called buffers. Now buffers are molecules that are going to minimize these pH changes. So they minimize pH changes. And they do this by binding or releasing hydrogen ions as needed to keep the pH stable. So an example of a buffer that is most commonly used in the body is called bicarbonate buffer, which is HCO3 minus. Uh, so bicarbonate. So bicarbonate is actually something that can soak up, uh, and that's not a technical term, but it kind of soaks up or it grabs onto hydrogen ions. Uh, so we have this bicarbonate molecule floating around in the bloodstream and other fluids, 
And if we add some hydrogen ion, like let's say we just drank some coffee or had a soda or some lemonade, and we have an increase in hydrogen ions in our digestive system that then gets transferred into our bloodstream, we have an increase in hydrogen ions. We don't want to make our body more acidic. So our buffer, our bicarbonate, bicarbonate buffer that's floating around in our bloodstream can grab on to this hydrogen ion, and then it will turn it into H2CO3. Notice this negative is counteracted by the positive, so it grabs onto the hydrogen. We add another hydrogen here, and it turns it into, this is called carbonic acid. So then we have carbonic acid floating around in our body. Since we no longer have this free-floating hydrogen ion, that's going to make it so that our pH is not changed. It doesn't become more acidic. But then, let's say we continue moving on, we're drinking water, drinking water, our body starts to get rid of some of the hydrogen ions, and then now we want to release those hydrogen ions back into the bloodstream because now our level of hydrogen ions is getting so low, we're starting to become alkaline or we're starting to become more basic. So then carbonic acid can then go back into being our bicarbonate and release these hydrogen ions into the bloodstream again so that we can maintain our pH. So we see this going back and forth here between carbonic acid. This is the same on both sides, of course, but going between carbonic acid and our bicarbonate plus the hydrogen ion. So if we somehow by food or by drink increase the hydrogen ions, bicarbonate can grab onto them or soak them up like a sponge. And then when we want to release those again, we can release them. <clears throat> so binding them at first to make sure that our pH doesn't change too much to be more acidic, and then releasing them so that our pH does not become too basic. And so our buffers are important in all of our systems um, and in all living things. Um, we're talking specifically about humans here with our bicarbonate buffer, um, but we see bicarbonate buffer as well as other buffers in other living things as well. So really quickly here at the end, I just want to kind of give an overview or a summarization of what we've been talking about in chemistry. So we talked about the atom, um, but when we're talking about molecules, just really quick, remember these are atoms held together by chemical bonds. And then remember we looked at two, kind of three, but two types of molecules or bonds, right? So we had our ionic bond and then we had our covalent bond. What's the third one we talked about as well? Right, our hydrogen bond. Now this is just a temporary bond and it's very, very weak, so it doesn't really count as creating a molecule, right? So our covalent bond actually creates a molecule. Those are held together um, because we are sharing electrons, right? So sharing electrons is a covalent bond. And in the ionic bond, they're being held together as well. In this case, we're gaining or losing electrons. Okay, and then the hydrogen bond is just temporary. That doesn't actually make a molecule, but we did talk about the hydrogen bond. So when we're talking about molecules, we have a covalent bond or an ionic bond. So then remember, part of our covalent bond, we could separate that into two different types of covalent bonds. What were those two different types? Right, nonpolar and polar. Right, so our nonpolar, remember, this is where they share electrons equally. Nonpolar is something that does not dissolve in water. And remember, this is called hydro, right, hydrophobic. And then our polar bond, on the other hand, is where we share electrons unequally. So we end up having this partial negative, partial positive. These do dissolve in water. And what is this called? Hydro right, philic. Good. And then over here for ionic bonds, we have our acidic molecules. Right? Those are the ones that release hydrogen ions in water. We have our basic molecules. These release hydroxide ions in water. 
In the case of acidic, what we're doing is we are going to decrease the pH then, right? Increase hydrogen ions, decrease the pH. With our, our basic molecule, we increase the pH because we're decreasing hydrogen ions. And then the third one was what? Good, our salts. And so then we have no change in hydrogen ions and no charge. Good, so we don't have any change in the pH either. All right, so that kind of summarizes some of the, the bonds, covalent, ionic, nonpolar, polar, acidic, basic salts. Um, and again, you do need to know all of these different things that we've talked about and um, even the more specifics about that we didn't just go over with the atoms and protons and, and neutrons and electrons and isotopes and, and all of those types of things as well.